And this is our, one of our Friday night loving kindness practice groups. We usually have it on the first Friday of the month. Then the third Friday of the month, Jean Haley and Jane Ryanhouse do the self-compassion group. And then the fourth Friday of the month, usually Stacy McClendon leads a loving kindness practice group. So three Fridays out of the month, just a chance for us to gather together and really learn, get better at keeping the beautiful attitudes of loving kindness in mind. And, you know, in a way, like so much of what we've learned in our spiritual lives, it's, it's I think, a, appropriate to reflect like, oh, we should have been taught this probably starting two or three years of age. And just because in a way it is the most accessible way to be happy is to have these wholesome attitudes of mind firmly established. I mean, just imagine if today, let alone for a whole life, but just today that our mind, our heart, was established in basic goodness, basic kindness, tenderheartedness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And that these were the sort of ongoing attitudes throughout the day. I mean, it'd be amazing. Our world would look very different. So usually when we come together, you know, I'll give some instructions, but basically we use about 45 minutes of the time and creatively, nimbly, as best we can, starting over when we lose the thread, we're just keeping one of these attitudes or emotions in mind. These are the four divine abodes. And what I thought tonight felt, for me at least, appropriate at the beginning of the year to do mudita. Some of you know that Pali word. It either gets translated as gladness or appreciative joy, sympathetic joy, but it's discovering and then keeping in mind the attitude, the quality of mind that sees beauty, that sees goodness and appreciates it. And of course, wrongly we think, well, I need pretty nice conditions in order to have that sympathetic joy. But actually, we want to challenge that notion that any moment it's possible for our heart in any moment to find, to connect with something that's worthy of appreciation. I mean, just the fact that 27, 28 of us can gather like this, you know, that's goodness that we can come together, that there are even at this moment. 27 people or whatever it is, 28 people who are interested in developing their heart. May this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. Like when we actually direct the mind in this way, it's not that hard to appreciate what's good. We just have to have the wherewithal to do it. Like it's got to get to the top of the priority list for the heart. That's the problem. It's not that mudita, appreciative joy practice is so hard. It's that it never really feels that relevant. <laughs> so part of what we want to do tonight when we're doing the practice, in our own experience of our body, our heart or mind, we want to notice how right it feels. It feels good. <clears throat> And it doesn't feel good because we're doing what we think we should be doing. So much stinginess, so much self-absorption, so much craving has to be put aside in order for me to keep this attitude of appreciative joy in mind. So to the degree my mind keeps it in mind, is established, then so much, you know, so much of the toxicity of my habit energies at least are temporarily abandoned. 
I'm just not involved in that ancient habit of like, if only I have this, if only I become this kind of person, then I'll be happy. And envious and, you know, of the people who have what we think we need to be happy. You know, we, every time that my heart is really attached to that prom promise, if I have this, if I become this, then I'll be happy. That means I put myself, put the heart in a contracted box because I'm not there where I think I'll be happy. I'm here, not having what I think will make me happy. So therefore I can't be happy. So we actually, we don't realize it consciously, but we're actually creating our own suffering that way. So when we, like we're going to do now, where we take some time, we sit comfortably. Of course, we all have our habits of mind. So the mind is going to, because of the momentum of our habit, it's going to go to the worries, the things we worry about. It's going to go toward the things we plan about, things we fantasize about, the things we hate, the things we want. So there are those well, well-worn habits or grooves that each of our minds have, and they're gonna express themselves during the meditation time. But as soon as we notice what the mind is doing, we just remember, oh yeah, I'm really making this resolve for 45 minutes or so to do whatever I can to keep that attitude of appreciative joy in mind. And the way we do it, the first step, it's like its own particular muscle. And in a way it's, it's a more obvious effort is we are arousing that emotion or that attitude of appreciative joy. So it might be something right there in your room or somebody in your home, your apartment, your house, or something that happened today. But often to arouse the attitude of appreciative joy, we bring to mind something that is relatively easy for the heart to appreciate. Maybe sometime today, you just notice the beauty of the world. We were driving, I'm out on the East Coast visiting um, my partner's family, 93 year old mother, uh, Wynn's mother. And we are driving from the Philadelphia area back to where we're staying on the coast of New Jersey. And, uh, as you get closer to the coast, it's wide open, not a lot of, so you can see, and it was just at sunset and it was really beautiful. And we had a, another snowstorm here in New Jersey. And so there's a few inches of snow, big open space, looking to the South and West and seeing the sun set out the window. And I just noticed the beauty of that. So even appreciating, oh, May the goodness of this earth we live on and the natural beauty of the earth we live on, may this continue, may it increase, may it never end. Now, of course, you may come up with your own couple phrases that your heart likes, or somebody might come to mind. Maybe you just noticed somebody being friendly today or when we were paying the tolls on the Atlantic City Parkway, you know, the person we gave them, I couldn't believe it because it's like one car after another, but this person, this young woman, they were so friendly. And just the way they greeted us and thanked us, you know, this is at a New Jersey Parkway, you know, turn our toll station. And so I can just bring that image to mind. May your happiness, may you know, because it's, I just sense that they had some real ease in their life, some basic happiness, even with a job that I wouldn't necessarily be that interested in. I mean, it's got to be kind of cold sitting in that little booth collecting $4.40 from each car that goes by. You know, may your happiness continue. May it increase. May it never end. That's not that hard for my heart to arouse that seeing something good in that spirit of that person that took our money. 
and just wishing whatever goodness I sensed in that moment, however ordinary, it's not that hard for my heart to wish that that goodness continue and increase and never end. And probably there are thousands of little images, memories that we can bring to mind. And you don't have to keep bringing different ones. You can keep going back to the same one. We walked into Wynne's mother's place and she's about to turn 94. And, you know, there were two cats. One was sitting on her lap, a very skinny cat that's been through a lot these last few years, kind of an older cat. And then another one sitting on her bed, all cuddled, cuddled up. And I could just bring that image to mind, just the friendship between Wynne's mother, elderly mother, and her cats. And just that sort of friendship that they have. May that goodness continue. May it increase. May it never end. So that would be the first part. We have to find our own creative ways, phrases, mental images, memories to arouse it, that feeling of appreciative joy. Once it has been aroused, we, we feel that appreciation. Then we want to notice... So the meditation, meditation object then becomes the generous or expansive flavor of that attitude. Because when we actually feel some appreciative joy, one of the things we'll notice is that it, it's sort of contagious. If we can appreciate this, then we can appreciate that. If we can appreciate this and that, then we can appreciate something else. And there's just a sense of, building the mo momentum or the capacity to recognize and appreciate what's good. And remember, this could be very ordinary, that somebody built some stairs, like we're on the second story of a building and the stairs on the, are on the outside. It's like, I appreciate that there are stairs with two handrails so I can get down in the icy weather. I mean, really ordinary stuff. You know, may the skilled carpenter who built the stairs, may their competence, their capacity to build something, may that, that's good. And may that goodness continue. May it increase. May it never end. So we're going to arouse it. We're going to notice it's expansive or generous or another way we talk about it sometimes in the early Buddhist tradition is this upwelling quality of mudita, or not just any of these four Brahma Viharas, four divine abodes. There's some expansive and generous reaching out, including inclusive quality. And that quality, when it matures, that, that leads to the third aspect of the practice. So we have arousing, Noticing the generous, expansive nature of the attitude. Noticing it's boundless. Like there's nothing in the field of awareness that isn't being touched, affected by the mudita, by the appreciative joy. It's that inclusive. So in a way, we could think of it as coloring the entire heart and mind. So whatever the heart and mind is sensitive to, is sort of affected by that quality of love, appreciative joy. And then the fourth, the last quality that we're developing is this, you could say this kind of trust in the heart's capacity to be appreciative. So we move from like me doing appreciative joy practice to me relaxing, trusting and abiding. So instead of doing appreciative joy, we're just becoming like the whole nature of the mind, the heart, the body, this life is this expression of appreciative joy. So you can think of that any number of ways merging, but it has that sense of resting back that whatever that goodness of appreciative joy, whatever that is, it's, it's, it's has sort of taken over. We can put down the burden of having to do it. 
it has its own feedback. It's, it has its own life. And we just trust that goodness, that appreciative joy. Okay, and I'll, I'll kind of cue us about these four, in a way they're stages, but you're gonna cycle back. You may sort of be in that more boundless and, and just abiding, and then you'll get distracted. And then you've been distracted so long that you really gotta go back and creatively arouse using some memories, using some mental images, using phrases, whatever works basically to rediscover, you know what? This heart is capable of being appreciative. How do I know? I'm feeling it. I'm doing it. It's, you know, it's right here. It's the emotion that's alive in the mind and heart right now. Cause I'm thinking about this person or thinking about this experience I had earlier today or earlier this week. And I'm feeling the generous quality of that emotion, that attitude. That's the second piece. Oh, I'm really noticing it's boundless. It touches everything. Oh, I can really trust it, I can really relax. So think of it as a, these four steps as the full blooming of the attitude of mudita, appreciative joy, these four, <clears throat> but arousing this attitude of appreciative joy. And this will work for any of the four attitudes of the divine abodes kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity is the fourth. But tonight we're working with mudita, appreciative joy. So arousing it, then specifically paying attention to the generous, upwelling, expansive nature of that attitude of appreciative joy, right? Because it has that energetic flavor of going out. You don't even need to do it. If you really connect with any of these qualities of love, you'll notice that upwelling, expansive quality. That's how you know you've actually aroused the right emotion, a wholesome emotion, because wholesome emotions have that inclusive, expansive, generous vibe to them. That's the second. Arouse, notice the generous nature of what's been aroused, the expansive nature. Let that mature until it seems to be boundless. Like the heart becomes like space, space of goodness. So everything we're sensitive to in the moment is affected or touched by that wholesome emotion of appreciative joy. And then the last is with that boundless quality more apparent, then just practice resting or abiding or trusting it, less doing something and more trusting the goodness, okay? Each of us in our own situation find a stable, relatively upright, and it's important that it also be relatively comfortable sitting posture, do the best you can. We want enough alertness that we won't just get into a sort of trance, dreamy-like state. But we don't, it's not useful to have physical pain. So if you can sit in a way that reduces any physical discomfort, that's nice. And we can all begin by just taking a couple relaxed and deeper breaths. And we have all the time in the world to fill and empty the lungs. No hurry. And even as we're doing a few of these longer, deeper breaths, it's really a nice opportunity to appreciate the body. This body, this really, truly amazing body, even if the body is old or even if the body is dealing with some sickness or difficulties, still it's truly amazing. This body that expresses millions of years of evolutionary intelligence, how to survive, how to deal with the ordinary and extraordinary 
challenges that come with being a living being. And even this capacity to breathe in air that the plants have all breathed out. They get the oxygen, just that symbiotic relationship with all the other life, breathing in, breathing out. There's sort of one mystery, one amazing mystery after another. Digesting plants and animals, generating heat, the capacity to sense. So you might find it useful to begin the mudita, the appreciative joy practice, one way to arouse this beautiful emotion. It's just to appreciate the body, the intelligence of the body, the resilience. Nobody's saying that it's perfect, but still the body is pretty amazing. And may this legacy of evolution, this legacy of all of our ancestors, not just our human ancestors, May all this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. Just appreciating the body, every single part, the skin, the skeletal structure, the muscles, All the organs, the heart, pumping blood, the lungs that bring the oxygen into the blood, the digestive organs, I care about this body. I care enough to be close, to be aware, to feel the body as I feel it. And I care enough just to appreciate it. May this goodness here, <clears throat> that is the body, may this goodness continue. May it increase. May it never end. It's really this capacity to appreciate that never ends. We know the body has its own natural cycle of birth, aging, and death. And from here, just maybe bringing a particular person or big, a particular creature to mind, like a pet, that's easy to appreciate. Might be a friend who has a particular personality attribute that you really admire and appreciate. Could be a pet that, that sense of play that you really appreciate. Then use your memory, some visual image or some felt sense of that person, that creature. And notice the appreciative joy that can arise. May this goodness continue. May it increase. May it never end. So try it on your own for a while in silence. Use your own phrase. So you can use the ones I've been saying, but come up with your own if you want. And don't feel like you got to keep moving on to different mental images or different memories. It's really okay to just stay with one for a while, even for a long time.
And remember these four skills that we're using. <clears throat> we're learning how to arouse the attitude of appreciative joy, how to be creative, basically whatever works. Once the emotion or the attitude is aroused, then we're learning how to notice the generous, expansive, upwelling of the emotion of the attitude. It's an inclusive attitude by its very nature. The third skill we're learning is how to recognize the boundless boundlessness of the emotion. It's really the maturing of that second skill, the expansive nature, is really letting that expansive nature be seen to its nth degree. And finally, we're learning the skill of trusting this wholesome emotion, this wholesome, wholesome attitude completely. So really abiding, resting, relaxing, and being this love of appreciative joy.
Remember to be willing to begin again and again. And there's no need to worry if the mind wanders. Just remember I'm here to cultivate this attitude of appreciative joy and to see for myself whether it's wholesome, whether it's liberating, frees the mind from contracted states. So we have to really give ourselves to these four skills, learning how to arouse the emotion or attitude of appreciative joy, learning how to notice the generous, expansive quality, notice its boundless quality, and learning how to trust and abide, and in a sense to become this appreciative joy. So it has this last step has the flavor of effortlessness. May this goodness continue, may it increase, may it, ne may it never end.
we usually start with people and animals that are relatively easy to sense this quality of appreciative joy. But when you have more momentum or confidence, then you can even bring other people to mind that it don't necessarily lend themselves for you to see their goodness or to be able to appreciate some aspect of their life, one of their qualities. So even problematic people in your life, you might be able to recognize something that is worthy of appreciation. It can be quite healing in our relationships to be able to appreciate everybody in some way. To really wish that the goodness in their life continue and increase and never end. This can even be done with our so-called enemies. So this is something you can experiment with in these last five or 10 minutes. If it feels like you have some momentum
and just like it's <clears throat> possible for us to be moved by the suffering in the world. We also want to be able to be moved by the goodness in the world around us. So these are the words of the Buddha, as many of you know, I will abide pervading all quarters, front to the right, behind me to the left, above and below, all around, everywhere and every way. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with mudita, appreciative joy, gladness, abundant, exalted, boundless. I will abide pervading this all-encompassing world, free from hostility, free from ill will. I will abide. So we're not forgetting or denying the very real suffering the greed and the hatred in the world. But for this time, we're practicing not forgetting the goodness, the goodness that's right here in our own life, in our own body, and the goodness all around us and everywhere. And just to, it's really okay to allow it to be a cause for happiness to give permission so the heart can smile, can open in a beautiful and wholesome way. May this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. And we'll finish up our practice by opening the eyes if they've been closed and beginning to move the body when you're ready. And of course, there's a couple of reasons we do these loving kindness or these uh, Brahma Vihara or divine abode practices formally as meditation topics. But the idea actually is to really um, develop these attitudes or emotions so that they become the dominant emotions as we live our days. Kindness, compassion, appreciative joy and equanimity. It's just kind of nice to imagine like if these were the only four emotions or attitudes I needed to live my life, what couldn't we do that we have to do in life with those four emotions? Probably all of us in our own ways, we've learned a thing or two about these beautiful emotions, attitudes of love in our lives. Just like we've learned a thing or two about how greed, hatred, and delusion don't really work as you know, dominant attitudes or qualities in the mind, you know, to go through life stingy or to go through life irritable or to go to through life full of greed and lust doesn't make us happy. It makes us really tight. Just imagine if we, the mind by just through practice got really good at not being oblivious because like you suggested,
that's the tendency we just, I mean, part of it, um, I think evolutionary biologists and, you know, and people who have thought deeply about this, they've concluded, I think, to some degree that what's gotten selected through evolution is this critical mind, you know, the mind that is better at noticing danger <laughs> as opposed to the mind that's really good at appreciating what's beautiful. And, uh, but the thing is we're not, obviously our heart is definitely affected by instinct and these maybe genetic tendencies, but we're not bound by that. We can cultivate habit, right? And, uh, we can cultivate this habit to recognize what's beautiful. And then the other thought that I had is when you get that momentum, then that's the time you can even let go of the different people you're bringing to mind and just notice the emotion or the attitude of appreciation itself. So the bringing the people to mind is the start, but once the heart has that sensitivity to what's good and the appreciation of what's good, then see if you can just notice that. Because we don't even need to be kind of reviewing the day from this point of view of seeing what's beautiful. That's the start. And that really starts to energize the heart. Like you said, it can get quite, the emotion can get quite strong. You don't have to stop thinking about those people or having those memories, but put the attention on the generous quality of that attitude, the expansive quality. And it actually, it, it refines the pleasure, the wholesome pleasure of this emotion to notice its generous nature, its inclusive nature. So there's the, the whole thing of, arousing we don't want to just stay at the state of arousing but we want to go into that more boundless relaxed state where it's uh the buddha calls it a temporary liberation of the heart all of these four qualities of love any actual spiritual love any state of spiritual love when developed it temporarily suppresses all of the neurotic, self-centered habits of greed, hatred, and delusion. And we actually experience a taste of what freedom is like. Because in those moments when it's really strong and boundless, this is the heart, this is the mind that is, in this case, you know, temporarily free of greed, hatred, and delusion. So you want to know what kind of mind a saint or an awakened being has, you know, when we're not there yet, we can have moments where we're really cultivating one of these four beautiful qualities of love. It gets some momentum, it dominates the heart and mind. We relax, trust that goodness, that attitude of love. And then we see, we, we notice, oh, this is a mind. There's no greed in this mind. There's no hate, there's no fear. There's no distraction in this mind. Oh, this is what that looks and feels like. We want to get familiar. I mean, we know the mind. I mean, a lot of what we learn in meditation practice is, oh, this is the mind that is colored by greed. <laughs> this is the mind that is affected by boredom. This is the mind that is restless. This is the mind that is full of hate. This is the mind that's really dull. This is the mind that's really distracted, right? But we also want, more importantly even, as important as it is to see the um, experience of the mind when it's affected by what we call one of the defilements, it's contaminated by unhelpful habits, right? It's even better to notice when the mind has been temporarily liberated. And this is not as rare as we might think. There are often moments of pure love. Like I mentioned, that simple moment at the toll booth. It did, I'm not saying it lasted for hours and hours, but there was a moment seeing the smile of that young woman, 
and just the basic friendliness and just appreciating that where my heart was pretty pure in that moment, you know, two or three seconds. That was a pretty pure heart. And one of the benefits of practicing is we start to notice those moments and noticing those moments amplifies the power of those moments. Because if I had had that moment with the person in the toll booth that had been oblivious, like didn't recognize that was a moment of goodness and then appreciating the goodness, then it loses the capacity that it has to really change our lives little by little, moment by moment. The mind, the heart is capable of being of compassion and mudita. It's the mind is really powerful. So as soon as the image, the understanding shifts in the mind toward the planet, the destruction of the planet, the overconsumption or whatever it was for you, then compassion was there. And whenever the the standing shifted to the appreciation of having such a competent car that starts when you turn it on and can get you from A to B. I mean, it's truly amazing. Cars are truly amazing. <laughs> They're incredibly comfortable too these days, right? And just the competence, how much human competence has gone into developing these vehicles. Amazing. And how they can function. These days, I don't know if people remember, but people my age and older, you know, they used to rust. Nowadays, <laughs> cars don't rust anymore. I, I mean, it's amazing. They're out there. And, you know, I live in Minnesota where there's a lot of salt on the road. There's yeah. not that much rust anymore. It's just incredible how they develop. And it, exactly like you said, it's a really good point because here's another sort of expression of what you're talking about a friend might come to mind or even somebody who, that we work with who we don't even like that much and we don't even consider them to be necessarily a good person mm. but we we remember they got a new pair of shoes you know mm. and we might even remember they were flaunting them you know they were sort of attached to them or whatever so that happiness that they were experienced might be really tainted by all these other aspects of their personality that maybe we don't consider that wholesome but still we can appreciate that we might see uh you know whatever a fly on some dog poop on the side of the sidewalk you know and we might just like i don't want to be close to that but that fly has found something it was looking for and why not? Why not? Why wouldn't we let that touch our heart? And then in the next moment, we'd be thinking, why didn't that person whose dog that was to pick up the poop after the dog pooped? You know? Yeah. And then we might have some compassion for ourselves. Oh, I live in a neighborhood where stuff happens and I'm not yeah. in control. And not being in control feels threatening. And I care about that. So it's like the heart can get really nimble in terms of the different things that it can, that can actually touch the heart. And it can go from see, uh, seeing one thing and, and seeing it in a beautiful, skillful way, seeing it, seeing the moment from another angle, but doing it in a beautiful, liberating way. Yeah. yeah. Because what it is, is it isn't the world, our experience isn't one thing, is it? Right. It's like there are probably infinite numbers of the way for my mind right now, for your mind right now to perceive this moment. Yeah. And the question is, with every percept, can every perception be have this quality of goodness, whether it's the tenderness of compassion or the friendliness of metta, loving kindness, yeah. or the balance of equanimity? or the appreciation of mudita that we've been working on. Beautiful to hear and to notice. Part of what's so beautiful about that is that you notice that truth of your mind. Because the whole point of doing this together is to learn about our hearts and minds and the capacity of the mind. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because there, there are some tried and true tricks to this point that you're making. 
And uh, one of the reasons that we use a phrase, especially a simple one, like the one I offered us all tonight, I think I originally heard it from Guy Armstrong or some version, something similar to that. Uh, may this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. But some people just use the word mudita, like they like the Pali, but you could obviously use the English if you prefer. Because all of those uh, people we brought to mind, all those situations where they were just seeing how many moments there were from the day that they could remember and bring to mind that were really the cause and support for that appreciative joy. So if we start to connect that confidence that there were those moments, there are those moments with a word like mudita or a phrase, may your happiness continue or may this goodness continue or something like that. Then like you said, when we're going to the boundless, it's very subtle. That's a subtle state for the mind. And it, it takes like we need special conditions to keep a subtle state in mind. It's not so easy to keep a subtle state of mind because grosser emotions, grosser memories, grosses, grosser experiences in our room, like a sound or a visual experience can arise and then it will trigger proliferation around whatever the interruption was, right? That's our common experience in meditation. And especially if we're just in our, we're not on retreat, you know, we're just in the world and we're just got our 30 minutes to practice it can get interrupted a lot. So then instead of going back to that way we began, we might presume that there's already some momentum though, even though we got distracted and we've been distracted for a couple of minutes even, we should assume we have to go all the way back. So if you've got an intermediary, like if you really worked with a phrase or a word, even before you bring to mind your cat being comfortable in its warm spot, and that's how you started the mudita practice. Oh, you felt really warm there. You were really happy in your spot. May that happiness continue. May it increase. May it never end, right? You may not need to go back to your cat or whatever you're using. You might just remember the word mudita and the felt sense of that upwelling of goodness, right? Like just that energy, or you might even learn that you that boundlessness is still there. It didn't go anywhere. It's more what happened is the mind got interested in something gross and disconnected or forgot to pay attention to what was subtle. So you're here paying attention to gross, like some memory, but then you realize you've been lost in thought. You really want to check that boundlessness may be there, but it, there's a real contrast from the gross mental activity the mind was involved with with the distraction to going back to the boundless state and we tend to dismiss it because it isn't as obvious as the distraction but that doesn't mean you're far away right so this is the thing about returning is you should presume like just it's a good practice to presume the goodness the boundlessness whatever is still there because if you don't, if you presume it's not there, then it's not going to be there, <laughs> right? So it's, you, and you won't look, you won't open, you won't listen for it. So just presume it's there. And then just skillfully, like, stage back a little bit. Like, is there that upwelling, that feeling of inclusivity in my heart right now? Maybe I'll drop the word mudita, appreciative joy in. And just like in a, soft way in the mind, just think that word, appreciative joy, or the phrase, may the goodness continue. Maybe even just one part of the phrase, maybe not all three, you know, may this goodness continue or increase or never end. Because just the memory of that expanded state may turn out to be the way back to it. You may not have to go all the way to the some memory that was really good today or in the past week. Yeah, and that's that taste of freedom. Like the Buddha calls this these practices uh, the temporary liberation of the heart because it doesn't uproot the tendency of our mind to get in contracted state. 
-hmm. but we really get a taste like you're talking about that this heart is unburdened that's a good way to describe the liberation it's like the heart feels unconstricted unburdened not weighed down like just like there's something so powerful it, it kind of in the same vein that you were sharing with us about like people sometimes it's us sometimes it's a good friend but you know people just attuned to the truth that life isn't always easy and then just somehow however they might do it like madeline's laugh at the end just having space for the world for life being the way that it is and just that creativity that you described like because sometimes we are in a funk. I don't know anybody who doesn't get in a funk. And, and the idea of somebody telling you to do mudita, appreciative joy practice, can feel like an insult or just, you know, a joke. But to kind of hang in there and to find our way. Like just the fact that we're not re rejecting it out of hand is something to appreciate. Oh, look at this, honey. You're hanging in there, you know. You haven't dismissed it or like you described, you know, just this capacity. I can't really access what I consider to be mudita, but I can appreciate that I can put down the world enough just to be with my breath. I can put down my worries. I mean, this is often how I begin my regular morning practice when I often do mindfulness of breathing, at least some of the time uh, at the beginning. It's like, I am so appreciative that all my impulses to think about this and worry about this, I could just be with my breath. I mean, to, and not perfectly by any means, but, and there's some real appreciation. So it's not even just mindfulness of breathing practice. It's this blending that some of you were talking about tonight of many different things of appreciative joy and that concentrating on the physicality of breathing in and breathing out, but appreciating that I have this developing talent to temporarily put everything else down and to simply know the physicality of breathing in for one half breath and then feel, know the physicality of breathing out for one half breath. Now let us make the four boundless qualities shine forth. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with gladness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, so above and below, 
around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, with a mind imbued with equanimity, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with the mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So nice to be with everybody tonight. And then the Buddhist studies class, which is on this topic of the four divine abodes, begins Monday night. So it's eight Mondays. You can do it in person. I'll be back in town. I'm leaving tomorrow. Come back to Minneapolis. Or we'll be online on Zoom. And uh, then Tuesday night, uh, Shelly and I will be leading a six-week introduction class. Uh, I'll do some of the weeks and Shelly will do some of the weeks. So joining for any of that, that makes sense. Uh, Mesky and Shelly and I will lead a workshop on the 22nd on the Four Noble Truths on living wisely in the world with suffering. So join in for that as well.